Following the fall of Cherbourg on June the 26th and Caen on July the 9th, the Allied lodgment area in Normandy was secure. To enable the Americans to break out on the western flank, it was now General Montgomery's intention to draw the bulk of the German armour opposite the British Second Army. Accordingly, he instructed General Dempsey, the commander of Second Army, to attack with the three armoured divisions of General O'Connor's Eighth Corps across the Orne bridgehead. Beyond the bridgehead was open country. Air reconnaissance photographs of the area had been studied in detail during training in England, and the country seemed eminently suitable for an armoured attack. The attack was codenamed Operation Goodwood. According to Allied intelligence, the attacking force could expect enemy opposition in a defensive belt three miles deep, screened by second-class formations. With its left-hand boundary on the river, the 16th German Air Force Division was thought to number about 2,100 men. It had second-class infantry divisions either side of it. Somewhere just south of Caen, it was believed that elements of another division were stiffening 16th German Air Force. It might be 192 Panzer Grenadier Regiment or Battle Group Look, both detached from 21st Panzer Division, a formidable opponent which was thought to be the immediate armoured reserve with elements as far forward as Cagny. There was some mystery about the location of 1st SS Panzer Division, Leibstand after, and 12th SS Panzer Division, Hitler Jugend. It was believed that they had been withdrawn into reserve, but it was not known where. If the resources of 1st, 12th and 21st Divisions were concentrated, the attack could expect to meet anything up to 250 tanks. Against this enemy, the 8th Corps was to launch its three armoured divisions, the 11th, the Guards and the 7th, into the open country which lay due south of the Orne bridgehead. But there were three problems. First, the Orne bridgehead was so small that only the leading division could be across at HR. Second, the southern boundary was protected by minefields laid by the 51st Highland Division just after D-Day. Uncharted and overlooked by the enemy, they could not be cleared. And third, the advance would be restricted by the outskirts of Caen and the Bois de Bavon to a front of 2,000 yards for some three miles. The plan contained a massive preliminary air bombardment by some 2,500 aircraft, a comprehensive fire support plan by about 450 25-pounders and about 300 medium and heavy guns with additional support from the fleet at sea and flanking attacks by 1st British Corps and 2nd Canadian Corps. The key to the ground to the south of the bridgehead was undoubtedly the Bulgabus Ridge. Thus, the leading division, 11th Armoured Division, was directed towards Bras and Rocancourt, with its lorried infantry brigade occupying Couverville and De Mouville en route. Cagny was to be masked until the Guards Armoured Division, the second division to advance, appeared. The Guards would secure Cagny and swing eastwards to Vimont. Finally, the 7th Armoured Division would advance between the other two divisions to Cramenil. Beyond this, the armoured car regiments would fan out and operate in a wide semicircle. H hour was to be 0800 hours on the 18th of July. At two and a quarter hours before H hour, 1,100 RAF bombers would attack these targets. One hour before H hour, 480 American medium bombers were to drop fragmentation bombs here. From H to H plus 30, 540 American heavy bombers would attack these additional targets. All this time, 300 fighters and fighter bombers were to attack further targets and carry out general interdiction. At HR, the 11th Armoured Division was to advance behind a barrage, moving at 150 yards per minute, fired by some 200 guns. Just south of the Caen Troan railway, the barrage was to stop for 15 minutes and then it was to continue southwest for 2,000 yards. Additional concentrations and barrages would support the flanking corps as they attacked, and three heavy regiments were to harass the villages south of the Caen Vimont railway. In all, 
it was to be the heaviest concentration of artillery and air support for a ground attack that had been mounted to that date. As it moved towards the concentration area, the 11th Armoured Division consisted of the 3rd Royal Tank Regiment, the 2nd Fife and Fofar Yeomanry, the 23rd Hussars and the 8th Battalion, the Rifle Brigade, in 29th Armoured Brigade. The 3rd Battalion, the Monmouthshire Regiment, the 4th Battalion, the King's Shropshire Light Infantry, and the 1st Battalion, the Hereford Regiment, with the 2nd Independent Machine Gun Company of the Royal Northumberland Fusiliers, formed 159 Brigade. The 2nd Northamptonshire Yeomanry were the Armoured Recce Regiment. Although they were only trained for reconnaissance, they were equipped with Cromwell tanks which were more suitable for armoured warfare. The Inns of Court were the Armoured Car Regiment. In addition, there was artillery and sapper support normal for a division at that time. The division was commanded by Major General Roberts. At the time of Operation Goodwood, he was 37 years old. Now, I would uh, like to, at this time to give you uh, a rundown of the morale and the training of the divisions taking part and their attitude to the prospective operation. Now, 11th Armored Division was originally formed by General Hubbard, who had formed the 7th Armored Division in Egypt and then came back and uh, formed the 11th Armored Division. So, uh, you can take it that 11th Armored Division was very well trained and raring to go because they had already been got ready for North Africa and then were stood down with great disappointment and now they were all ready to go. Uh, they had no battle experience until they came to Normandy but they had already had one battle called Operation Epsom which was a rather frustrating battle, but nevertheless gave them some battle experience. There was one regiment which had battle experience, and that was the 3rd Tanks, who'd had a great deal. But they had a very good commanding officer and some good squadron leaders, and uh, they uh, were able to uh, hold their end up with the tremendous A-law with which the other new and fresh regiments uh, were producing. Now, in Eight Corps, in England, we had studied the country over which we might operate on the invasion, not only on maps, but also on extremely good air photographs. And we'd all come to the conclusion that if we had to operate, we hoped we'd operate in the area of the open rolling country south, southeast of Corps. And here we were faced with an operation over that particular country. Of course, the fact that the Germans appreciated that it was a good tank country, too, perhaps we did not consider too heavily. Now, the Guards Armed Division. This was to be their first battle. They did not take part in Operation Epsom because they hadn't arrived in time for that battle. And as far as I know, no, uh, nobody in the division had fought in armour before. But they had been in eight corps with us and they had done similar studies of the ground and the enemy opposition such as we knew about it uh, with us at the same time so they had a view on the battle much the same as ours were raring to go and so what they could do now we turn to seventh armed division they were quite different quite different in this way that they had fought in all the desert campaigns they had then fought in Italy. They had come back just in time for Christmas and had some nice leave. And uh, they were, I think, uh, with so much experience, they were a little too wary, wary, not weary, too wary, and a little too canny. And they certainly did not have the same enthusiasm for this battle as either ourselves or the Guards Armed Division. Uh, now, a word about the plan. The original plan, when given to me, was that we were to be responsible for taking the two villages of Couverville and Demerville and also Cany. Now, I didn't care for this very much because to take Couverville and Demerville, 
it would uh, be necessary also to take some uh, woods to the east of the first village and it is clearly a, at any rate a two battalion operation and then to do that I should have to li leave uh, an artillery regiment which normally worked with the infantry brigade and I would also have to give them some tank support. So right at the outset I was going to be minus almost half the division. I therefore remonstrated to the corps commander that this was going to be the situation and would be a severe handicap to my further operations, as it were, with one hand behind my back. In addition, I'd been given Cagny, and I thought that would uh, delay our advance onto the objectives which we had been given, which were on the right or west of our advance. However, the corps commander wouldn't agree to relieve me of the first requirement, that is, taking Couverville and Demerville. I represented this problem verbally and also in writing, and finally was told that if I didn't uh, feel it was a sound plan in view of the experience I'd already had of armed warfare, then he would get another armored division to lead. So, of course, I undertook that particular task and we remained the leading of the division. But there was one amelioration, and that was that instead of having to take Cagny, I was only required to mask it. Now, as the tale unfolds, you will see how unfortunate that decision was by the corps commander, because although he didn't know it, it did, and it was going to have a considerable effect on the operation as a whole. Now you must hear how an armoured regiment was organised and how it operated. And to tell you about it is Major Bill Close, who was a very experienced armoured regimental man. He saw action in France in 1940, then in the desert, and then to Greece, and then back in the desert again, and then in Normandy. In July 1944, I was a major commanding A squadron, one of the three Sabre squadrons of the 3rd Royal Tank Regiment. Each squadron consisted of a headquarter troop of three tanks and four fighting troops of four tanks. The troops were equipped with three Sherman tanks fitted with 75 millimeter guns and one, the Firefly, a 17-pounder. The Sherman was a very reliable tank mechanically, but we were completely outgunned by the 75 millimeter long and the 88 millimeters guns of the German armor. To give you an example, the Sherman 75 millimeter couldn't hope to penetrate even the side plates of a Panther tank at ranges over 500 yards. The Firefly, on the other hand, was a much better tank, but the German anti-tank gunners had cottoned on to the presence of the Firefly and used to pick them out first. So, to counter this, we echeloned the Firefly behind the three Sherman 75 millimeters as we advanced. Each squadron had an attached motor company drawn from the 8th Rifle Brigade. Our particular company was G Company, commanded by Major Nell Bell, and David Stileman, commanding 11 platoon, and he is the man who will tell you more about the composition of the company. You've heard from a distinguished divisional commander, and also a gallant, battle-experienced squadron leader. And now to the other end of the social scale, a mere platoon commander, age 20, but sylph-like, at the time of Operation Goodwood. I commanded 11 platoon, G Company, 8th Battalion, the Rifle Brigade. The company commander, Noel Bell, was everything and more that a young officer could hope for in action. A motor company was attached to each armoured regiment and consisted of a scout platoon.